Nothing could have prepared me for the absolute darkness that Tears of the Kingdom would bring out of us. <clears throat> uh, but really, I'm just as degenerate as all of you are, so let's turn one of my favorite forms of Korok torture into an adorable but slightly off-putting sculpture. The Korok Rocket, or a uh, Korokit. And the first thing we're gonna do is make our Korok. If you've ever wanted to get into polymer clay sculpting but were too intimidated, a Korok is a very easy first project, and there's actually an entire dossier on possible Korok design combinations, so you can really customize them any way you want. Now, personally, I'm partial to a brown body with a lotus leaf face, so that's gonna be our test sub- or sorry, Korok for this sculpture. And to shape his body, I'm just pinching the four corners of the little log of clay I rolled up until they look like his two legs and the two sticks on his head. Then I ruthlessly impale him on a toothpick, and definitely not for my own sick amusement, it's so I can have a bit more leverage while sculpting his arms. Once they're on, I use some alcohol to smooth them out as much as I can before baking him for the first time. I give him a nice pointy nose, and then start working on his mask. Now, one of my friends on YouTube, Isabelle's Drafting Table, actually did a really cool video on the backpack Korok, and because I have the memory of a goldfish, I ended up choosing the exact same Korok face that she chose first. So go watch her video after this one to see the cool different techniques she used and the artistic direction she took with her Korok. She did an amazing job. For my Korok face, I'm using clay for the main leaf and using paint to add in all of the leafy details. My hands are nowhere near steady enough to add in these super thin yellow lines that divide up the leaf, so I used some painter's tape to get nice clean lines and also so I could savor the peelies. Then I used one of my thin needle tools to paint on his adorable Korok face. Once his leafy mask is all done, I use a lighter brown to detail his body. I'm gonna attach the mask to the body, and now we can use him as a size reference for the ginormous backpack that these idiots lug around Hyrule. I'm using foil to bulk out the center of the backpack, and once I get a good size, I'm gonna cover it in a smooth layer of white clay. Now while that bakes in the oven, I'm gonna grab some bright green clay and flatten it into a giant pancake, so I can use some scrap fabric to give it a cool texture. Once the backpack base is out of the oven and cooled down, I apply a layer of bacon bond like a severely underpaid worker at Cinnabon. This will help the green clay stick properly while I cut off all the excess. And once all the extra clay is cut off, there are still some seams that I wanna hide, so I use the scrap fabric to blend them out. After curing the clay in the oven, everything is looking pretty good besides that one patch of clay, but that's where we'll attach the Korok, so don't worry about that. But before we start adding all of the rest of the backpack details, I'm gonna drill a hole to make room for the light source for the little acorn lamp that's attached to the side. Once that's done, we can start adding all of the leather details to the backpack, and I figured I'd try out a new type of clay for this part, and man, I'm glad I did, because this stuff looks amazing. It honestly kind of reminds me of a thick brownie dough, so throughout using it, I had some moments, some really tough moments where I just wanted to take a bite out of it. Thankfully, I did not. But the first leather part we're gonna tackle is the bottom of the backpack. After cutting out an oval and attaching it to the bottom with some more bacon bond, I cleaned up the edges, and once it was smooth, I could indent individual stitch holes with my needle tool. After baking it to save my progress, I added the individual stitches with a bit of tan clay. Next up is the blanket that the Koroks take with them, and to make this, I grabbed a different scrap fabric to add a subtle texture to a little square patch of clay. Then I rolled it up into the world's least edible taquito and added some leather straps on both ends. It ended up being a tad bit too long, so I cut a piece from the middle since that'll be covered by the top of the backpack, and finally I squished it down a bit so it didn't look so stiff. Next up on our to-do list was the top flap, and for that I cut out some leather clay as well as more of the tan clay I used for the stitching and layered them on top of each other.
Once it was in place, I used tiny balls of silver clay to act as the metal buttons that attach the two pieces. I added a front pouch with some more of the green clay I had and used the scrap fabric to texture it like I did the body. Then I made a tinier flap for the pouch and started making the leather straps that would keep these pouches closed when they inevitably get dragged face down for miles across Hyrule. Once they all had buckles, I added some more dots of silver clay and some adjustment holes for each strap. Now I'm going to cure this in the oven one more time, but off camera I used a tiny bit of translucent clay to make the body of the acorn light. Once I knew it looked good, I moved on to making another accessory for the backpack, which is a metal mug, and I gave that a few coats of a gunmetal gray. Once the paint dried, I attached a leather strap around the handle and secured the strap right under the blanket. And now it's time to work on these Zonai rockets that we will be strapping to this poor, unsuspecting Korok. Now Tears of the Kingdom added a bunch of new devices that made the possibilities of harming innocent Koroks virtually infinite, but the rocket is one of my favorites. I baked the general shape first, but ended up needing to sand them a little bit, so to get rid of those scratches, I wiped both of them down with some acetone. The next part is making the four fins at the bottom of each rocket. I mixed up a much lighter clay and baked eight of the same shape. Then once they were baked, I shaved away at the corners to achieve a stone-like appearance and attached them to the body. From here, we're going to tackle the rockets in sections, the first being the center portion that shows Zonai text and the rocket symbol surrounded by cobblestone. I'm using a piece of parchment to cover up the area that won't have any texture on it, and once I'm done, I use a little bit of alcohol to smooth it out. Then I can remove the parchment and start adding the Zonai text text and rocket symbol. Then I'm basically going to repeat everything I just did seven more times until each rocket has four of these panels. Now once both of the rockets had all of these panels on, I baked both of them so I wouldn't ruin any of the patterns I just created, and now there's a blank space between each of them. I'm going to fill in these spaces with clay and flatten it as best I can. Then I'm just going to indent the soft clay with one of my tools and repeat this step until all of the spaces between the first panels are filled and detailed. Once they are detailed, I'll be focusing on the tip of the rockets where there's a few strips of clay all with different details carved into them. Once I finish that, I can add the jets at the bottom of the rocket, and those are just little coins of clay that I stacked on top of each other and indented with my needle tool. And with that, we finally finished everything on the rockets except for the painting, which we'll get to shortly. However, I know you and everyone else in the community view me as the Korok torture expert, which you should, and I am, but I wouldn't be able to, in good faith, classify this whole thing as authentic grade A Korok torture unless the rockets were actually turned on. So for that, I'm going to be using the brightest turquoise clay I could find and blending a bit of a lighter blue clay into the base of the flame. Now I ended up adding a bit more clay to the tip of the rocket just because it looked a bit too small, but once that was done, we could finally start painting. I'm painting all of the areas that will eventually be gold with a yellow base coat first, and since I'm prone to making mistakes, I clean up any mishaps with some acetone. Once the base coat was on, I painted all of those areas with a few layers layers of gold, and then I painted all of the engraved Zonai letters with a bright blue. With the painting all done, I attached the flame to the base of the rocket, and finally I attached the Korok to its backpack. 
If you know me, you know I'll never turn down the opportunity to thrash a Korok around, and this time it was definitely just to make sure the Korok was secured properly to the backpack. <clears throat> anyway, with him securely attached, we can add the backpack straps with more leather and tan clay. With all of our elements pretty much done, we can use Ultra Hand to fuse them together. I'm gonna add a blob of blue clay on both sides and push the rockets into them, baking them so that everything becomes one piece. To make the clay look more like the fuse goo, I ended up just mixing some resin with gold paint, so it's not entirely accurate, but it is fabulous. And now it's time to make our base. The first thing I'm doing is using some white clay to make a rock for our Korok to sit on before he's blasted into space. And while that's baking, I'm gonna take the XPS foam that I'll be using as the core of our base and making room for the battery of our light. Once the rock is baked, I glued it on where I want it and do a little test fit to make sure our Korok is at the right angle. And speaking of angles, I'll be cutting and sanding into the sides of the base to taper them off so it looks a bit more natural. And because I'm a slave to all of my creative impulses, I decided I wanted a little fleet lotus puddle over here, so I used some more white clay and foil to make that. Once that was attached, I gave the entire base a few coats of gesso. Once that dried, we are going to be adding color to the base in layers, starting from the darkest color and dry brushing our way up to the lightest color. Once we do that with brown, I'm gonna be doing the same thing with some green as a base for our static grass. Now it's time to be a bit vulnerable and admit that my static grass application has seen much better days. Luckily, this isn't too hard to hide. I can disguise this later by adding a bunch of moss and to really take your mind off my shoddy landscaping job, we're gonna be adding some fleet lotus seeds around the puddle. I mixed up a bright yellow clay and rolled it up into a thin noodle. Then I cut a bunch of sections out of it and started to smush them together to kind of create a half sphere. I made the outside nice and smooth in preparation for some soft pastel powder that will give it a nice ombre effect. And while I had my pastels out, I also made some super simple lotus leaves as well as a couple of lotus flower buds. And this is the spread we're working with once they all came out of the oven. I'm gonna be painting on the lotus seed pods with some brown and yellow acrylic paint. Once I finish painting them, it's time to attach all of our different elements to the base. And the first thing I'll do is drill a hole for the light to come out of and then glue on our translucent acorn light to the backpack. Once the acorn is attached, then I can glue down our Fleet Lotus accessories and mix up a little blue resin for the puddle. And I know you've been thinking this, but I definitely did not make a huge blunder off camera where I spilled a lot of resin over the grass. And to make you completely forget about that possibility, it's time to tell you about this video's sponsor, my Patreon. That's right, I'm sponsoring my own video. It's my video and I get to choose the sponsor. If you wanna see updates of my crafts where I definitely don't do unspeakable things to Koroks, like, I don't know, try to microwave them, uh, bury them alive, shove them in a toaster, or, you know, waterboard them. Again, all things I would never do. Then uh, go support me over on Patreon. Okay, enough shameless self-promotion. Here are the final shots for the canonically greatest Korok torture method. And as always, I have to give a very special thank you to my patrons, especially my new DIYer, Lucas G, my new crafter, Christian Kung, and of course, my glorious artificer, Josh K. You guys hold the Koroks down while I strap the rockets to them, and I just couldn't do it without you. Anyway, let me know what other tiers of the kingdom crafts you guys want to see from me. I'm thinking maybe Kochi Dye Shop in Hateno Village, or maybe a Frox, but you guys let me know what you want to see next in the comments. And if I catch you not watching all of my other Zelda videos, you will be in big trouble. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you next time.